welcome everyone um, who's um, who's uh, able to attend. Uh, yeah, we're very excited to uh, to give you this presentation today um, on uh, IP and uh, tech law uh, for emerging companies. Uh, my name is Pablo Sang. Uh, I'm a partner at Macmillan LLP, and my practice uh, predominantly focuses in on intellectual property, um, and specifically uh, with uh, patent issues and trademark issues as well. Um, in addition to that, um, I, uh, I, I I help out with uh, commercial agreements um, that are related to intellectual property. So anytime intellectual property assets are transferred between entities, um, that's also where I chip in. And uh, with me today is my partner, Robert. Thanks, Pablo. And so, yeah, my name is Robert Piazantine. I'm also a partner in the, the Macmillan office downtown Vancouver. Um, my practice focuses on the commercialization of technology and setting up businesses and, and um, providing the advice necessary to help you grow a business so that you can actually um, take advantage of the great idea that you've come up with. Um, I work quite closely with Pablo in terms of the uh, the general um, technology commercialization side of things. I'm also responsible or co-chair of our startups um, group. So um, we have a, a a number of our lawyers in our firm that help uh, startups as they grow as they're trying to grow their business. Um, and we work everything from incorporations of companies through to um, shareholders agreements to whatever else you might need as the company grows. Um, and so we've got a, a number of people that are here that can always help with that sort of stuff. And so we'll touch on all of that during uh, a bit of that on my session of the part of the session, which is in the second half of the presentation. So back to you, Pablo. Right. So we're going to break up this uh, presentation into two parts. Um, I'll lead the uh, the first part of the discussion, which is uh, pr uh, which will be focused on uh, intellectual property protection. So the uh, kinds of issues that you'll typically come across um, as a startup company or as a developed company. Um, so that's going to be the first part of the presentation. And the second part of the presentation will be led by Robert, um, who will talk about commercialization and monetization of uh, IP and tech assets. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, share my screen with you. Um, just give me a sec. Um, so I believe that um, my screen is now shared with you. Um, is there any way that, let's see. How do I indicate? If there's any way for anyone to indicate that uh, they can hear me or, or see the screen, that would be great. Robert, can you hear me? Great. I can see the screen now. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, that's good. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead. So today's presentation will be broken up um, as we discussed into two parts. Uh, first part will be uh, talking about what exactly is IP. So we're going to provide you with a brief overview of what you'll likely encounter um, in your business in terms of intellectual property assets. And the second part, of course, is, well, now that you've protected your IP, now what? Um, and that part will be led by uh, Robert. So what is IP or intellectual property? Um, as a brief overview, I typically like to lead off with uh, something uh, that's seemingly straightforward or simple, like a bottle of water. The bottle of water itself uh, encompasses a lot of examples of intellectual property. Um, if we focus in on the, uh, the branding or the labeling of the bottle of water, uh, we'll encounter things like uh, trademark rights. If we look at the aesthetic look of the bottle design itself, um, we will encounter things like industrial design or design protection. We look at the, uh, the, uh, the water within the bottle. Perhaps there's uh, something unique in the way that the water is treated. Uh, perhaps there's a method of filtration um, that gives the water a distinct taste or helps filter out particular um, elements or or compounds uh, that you're not interested in. That method of filtration uh, could be covered under a patent protection. Um, in addition to that, uh, there may be something unique in the way you process the water that you don't necessarily want to disclose um, to anyone else. Um, that kind of undisclosed intellectual property may form trade secrets. So in an everyday product um, that either um, um, that, that's typically rolled off the shelf, um, you will see or encounter different aspects of intellectual property. And those are the kinds of aspects that uh, we'd like to touch on briefly today in today's presentation. If 
first thing uh, I'd like to chat about is trademark law. Um, as discussed above, the uh, trademark law, as it pertains to that bottle of water, uh, focuses on the labeling of the water, how you want your bottle of water uh, to be identified to your target market. So at its core, the trademark itself serves as a source identifier, meaning that when people see the trademark, they see a link between the product and you as the source and no one else. And so anytime there's potentially a third party that might use a confusingly similar trademark, that becomes an issue from a consumer perspective because, well, now it's hard to identify what source the product is coming from. And uh, so issues of confusion also arise in trademark law. And so when selecting a trademark, something that will uh, distinguish yourself from your competitors, it's prudent to select a unique name um, and one that um, wouldn't uh, create so much confusion in the marketplace. And likewise, if there's a third party that um, uh, chooses a mark that is similar to yours, that's where you can exercise uh, a lot of your, uh, your, your, your legal rights in forcing that person to change its mark or at least amend it. Another thing to keep in mind about trademark law is that its protection or its uh, the rights in a trademark stem from continual use of the trademark. And continual use of it simply means that you know, as you are in, the, uh, in, in commerce and trading, there's no gap, uh, long period of gap where you're not using the mark and you don't intend to use it in the future. Um, and so the, uh, the issue of using it um, for a long period of time is quite important in trademark law. A fourth point that's also important in trademark law right now um, is the issue of whether you are first to file or first to use. Um, it's actually a mixed bag of both. Um, in Canada, um, if you intend to use a trademark, um, but you want to reserve your rights in that mark even before you use it, it would be prudent to file um, or apply to register the trademark with the uh, Canadian Trademark Office. Um, but that being said, uh, maybe you haven't uh, registered it or applied to register it and you're already using it in commerce. That first to use also entitles you to um, rights in the trademark already, albeit restricted to the geographical region that you're actually operating in. So um, in terms of protecting your trademark strategy, in terms of the scope of your business, um, you will likely try to balance uh, or try to you know, strike a balance between what to do, whether to file, um, and that is to apply to register the trademark, or simply just to use it in the marketplace and generate um, rights and accrue rights uh, that way and expand your um, uh, geographical scope eventually. So to your right, uh, or on the right side of the slides, are examples of trademarks that uh, Macmillan LLP has applied to register. Um, so the, uh, the mark you see on the top is typically the mark that um, Macmillan LLP uses when it's trying to attract uh, business um, from the States. Uh, we brand ourselves as America's Canadian law firm. Um, the middle trademark that you see um, is, um, is one that you'll see quite often on Macmillan branding. And the one on the bottom um, is the trademark that's used by the policy arm or the uh, government relations arm of Macmillan. So as you, uh, for your business, um, uh, as it grows, uh, you may not just have one trademark. You may have you know, um, one trademark that you know, overarches the, um, the, uh, the general business that you do. But from there, your business may have a series of um, trademarks that are specific to a particular aspect of your business. So if your business is broken up, say, into three or four different aspects, each of those aspects may have its own trademarks um, that you would um, likely uh, be interested in protecting. Um, and, um, and so it's, um, it's, it's quite common for emerging companies or um, larger companies to have a large trademark portfolio that way. Trademark law in Canada is federal in nature, meaning that the, uh, the overarching acts and regulations that govern trademark law uh, apply throughout Canada regardless of where you are. 
And that's important from uh, seeking, uh, particularly when you're uh, applying to register for a trademark. Uh, once you secure a trademark registration from the Canadian Trademarks Office, uh, the rights that you have in that trademark are across the country, regardless of the geographical scope um, that you actually practice in. So um, that's one reason why some people like to apply to register for a trademark, notwithstanding the fact that they might be doing the bulk of their business right now in Vancouver. They forecast that, hey, two, three, four years down the line, I'm likely going to expand across Canada. So it might be prudent for me to apply to register for a trademark now and seek those uh, national rights preemptively. Um, that being said, um, it's common for companies to stay local, um, and particularly if they're comfortable with the size of their business being local, in which case it may not be of any true value to apply to register for a trademark, particularly if you have no desire to expand the geographical scope of your business, or you really don't care what someone in Nova Scotia is doing, um, if they're even adopting the same name or mark as you. For the trademark um, uh, application process, um, this, is, um, this slide uh, presents an overview of what you will likely encounter when you apply to register for a trademark. You submit an application. Uh, the application um, uh, sits uh, with a trademark examiner, um, uh, and the examiner will examine the trademark uh, application for compliance with the Trademarks Act and uh, regulations. If the application is compliant, uh, it will then be advertised for opposition, in which case third parties, um, any third party, uh, will have the right to oppose um, your trademark application. And, um, and this right is uh, given to third parties um, uh, just in case the examiner um, uh, missed something or didn't see or didn't deem something important uh, during their examination process. Uh, any third party would then have a right to um, bring those uh, uh, issues that may have been missed by an examiner uh, to a, an opposition board for that opposition board to review and consider um, against the, uh, the trademark application in question. Now, if there's no opposition launched or the opposition for whatever reason fails, um, then the trademark application proceeds to allowance and then it proceeds to registration. And, um, and upon registration, um, the, uh, the trademark registration lasts for a period of 10 years. And then after 10 years, um, you just have to pay a renewal fee. Um, but from registration to renewal, um, there's also an assumption that you're still using the trademark. And if you're not using the trademark uh, for a period of three or more years, then the trademark registration is subject to non-use cancellation proceedings. And that's where um, uh, what I alluded to before, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the need to continue to use the trademark post-registration and throughout the course of your business is important for uh, trademark rights. Now, say business has been good for you locally, but your intention is now to expand it further um, globally, and you're looking to protect it in other jurisdictions, your, your trademark in other jurisdictions in Asia, South America, or Europe. Um, there are various mechanisms uh, for you to keep costs low, um, but at the same time also um, reserving your rights, um, your trademark rights in the jurisdictions that you want. Uh, one mechanism that uh, you may come across either early on in your business or later on in your business is the international trademark filing system, um, which allows you to make, it's basically a one-stop shop uh, for you to submit an application to an international bureau, who, uh, which will then um, help you reserve your rights in uh, jurisdictions that you want your rights reserved. Um, in order for you to crystallize your rights in the jurisdictions you, you really want to protect in, you eventually do need that application reviewed by the local authorities. Um, but there are a number of strategies that are available to you, one of them being this international trademark filing uh, system, um, that are available to you so that you can uh, effectively protect your rights um, in the manner that you wish to protect it, while also keeping costs um, in check um, um, as you grow your business.
This is just an overview of uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, international trademark system. We're at stage one. You have a base filing, uh, say in Canada, uh, you've submitted an application to protect your trademark. Um, and then from there, you can proceed to stage two and file an international application that um, claims priority to a base application. And after it's received by the International Bureau um, and, uh, and, and, and complies with the uh, for formality checks, it's then sent to a third stage, uh, which is directly the um, the um, the uh, the local examination, uh, the local authorities that um, that um, that will be examining your uh, your your, uh, your your trademark application. So it could be the European one that you've designated, or the Chinese one that you designated. Um, those local authorities will also give your trademark application a further look to make sure that it complies with their uh, local laws. gears to another um, intellectual property um, asset that you may come across uh, early on um, or later on uh, in your in, in your business um, is the issue of patents um, when I speak of patents here I'm speaking of uh, utility patents um, which are uh, essentially um, common inventions that you think of whether it's mechanical in nature or whether it's a chemical method or a method of manufacturing um, those are the things that I'd like to cover here today. Um, those kinds of uh, inventions, um, in order to um, uh, in order to um, to be, I guess, uh, patentable, must satisfy three basic criteria, and these include issues of novelty, inventiveness, and utility, meaning that your invention has to be useful. Uh, there are some statutory bars um, as to what is not patentable uh, under a utility patent uh, regime. And these include things like abstract theorems, uh, mathematical formulae, and nothing that is naturally occurring in nature. So the focus of this particular presentation is on utility patents, but um, you'll hear the word uh, patent thrown around um, and, and used um, in different circumstances to represent different things. And depending on where you are in the world, um, there are um, different meanings perhaps associated with the word patents and in terms of what uh, it actually entails. So in other countries, um, uh, they adopt a modified or, or a, a simplified patent system uh, known as the utility model patent uh, system, which in that circumstance, um, an application is filed for something that's similar to an invention, but the examination process is less rigorous. Um, Canada and the United States don't have this system, but this system is alive and well in jurisdictions like Germany and China, uh, where they have a two-tiered uh, patent system. Um, in the States, you may hear uh, things like a design patent, um, which is akin to what we call in Canada an industrial design, uh, where you are only protecting the aesthetic look uh, of the product, the physical product um, that you want to protect. Um, in the United States, um, you may hear uh, the word patents being applied to plants uh, in terms of uh, plant patents. Um, but in Canada, uh, the, uh, the comparable mode of protection up here is known as plant breeders' rights. So depending on where you are in the world um, and depending on what you want to refer to, the word patents uh, does attract different meanings to different people. So, um, so it could be, uh, it is important to make sure that you're clear on what exactly you, uh, you want to talk about. And um, three drawings or three figures that are provided here are just examples of what is covered under a utility patent system. On your left, you have a thermal break, um, which is a device that you put in between an exterior wall and an interior wall uh, to provide insulation between the two. In the middle, you have some sort of adapter. Um, and on the uh, third, uh, the, the figure on the right, you have a pair of pants, um, which uh, presumably is something that's um, patentable there might refer to the way that the pant is hemmed to, uh, sewn together, uh, whether there's uh, maybe perhaps an, addition, an, an additional gusset somewhere to give the plant um, more, um, um, or to the user of the pair of pants uh, more I don't know, uh, comfort uh, when they wear it. So those are the things that are kind of covered or examples of things that are covered in the utility patent system. An overview of the application process, um, similar to the trademark application process, you initiated by filing an application or your patent. 
uh, for your invention. And that application includes a nice description of what exactly uh, your invention is. Um, after you've submitted it for, uh, to a patent office, a patent examiner will review your application to see if the invention that you describe is new, inventive, and useful. And uh, if it is, and it satisfies the other criteria of the patent system, um, then the uh, patent application is allowed and uh, eventually uh, registered. Uh, the patent protection period um, that, um, if it goes to registration, is 20 years from the filing date. Um, so, in exchange for essentially disclosing to the world what you've invented, um, a government is willing to give you 20 years worth of protection um, in exchange for your disclosure and your teaching of the world what you've invented. As you can imagine, with uh, similar to trademark law, um, with the patent system and depending on how how far you want your protective uh, uh, rights to reach, um, there's different strategies that you can employ um, in order to one preserve your rights in jurisdictions while you're banging on doors to uh, to uh, to drum up for funding uh, to further your patent uh, patenting process, or if you're thinking that you know this patent is really only useful for North Americans and have and, and has no use for Asians or Europeans, then you might want to restrict your application process or your your and, and protect only in say Canada and the United States, in which case you might adopt a different process. So similar to um, and I'll scroll down Similar to the trademark system, there's also an international filing system uh, available for um, the utility patent system. And um, this is known as the uh, Patent Cooperation Treaty um, um, International Patent System. Uh, and the filing here is, you know, you draft your patent application describing your invention, then you submit your uh, application to an international bureau. Um, and that international bureau um, reviews the application and gives you an idea of whether your invention is patentable. And then from there, um, you then designate the specific jurisdictions that you want protection in, and then request those specific local jurisdictions to do a further review of your international application uh, to see if it complies with local laws and whether local laws will grant, uh, or the local authorities will grant uh, your patent uh, in those uh, local jurisdictions. Uh, Similar to, I guess, the um, uh, trademark filing system, you should only think of this international filing system as kind of like a holding tank or a, um, a time placer or, or a time holder. No rights actually are ever granted off an international application, meaning that if you don't take further steps down the line, your international application just dies. You're only paying for the international application to reserve your rights and your right to enter local jurisdictions when the time comes. Um, so it's only a uh, it's only a time holder and it's not a and, and even if you get a, a, a nice report from the international uh, authorities, um, it's of no value to you if you do not take that extra step and designate and pursue protection at the local level. A third uh, intellectual property um, 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 aspect that I'd like to uh, chat with you about today is uh, industrial designs. Um, you may hear it um, in the United States referred to as design patents. Um, here in Canada, we call them industrial designs. And the purpose or the focus of this um, intellectual property uh, protection system is to protect the physical look, the aesthetic um, look of your product. Um, and so it's um, the protection is what's essentially seen solely by the eye. Um, there's no intention to protect any utilitarian features or any methods or principles of manufacture or construction. It is purely just the look of your product. Um, and here we have some examples of what might be protectable. Um, the one on the top right um, is a luminaire holder. Uh, so one of those um, um, uh, pot lights, uh, pot light holders um, that, that you may have uh, in your ceiling. Um, you can get uh, design protection for shoes. 
uh, mugs or even wallet or phone case holders. In Canada, um, the length of protection for these um, uh, industrial designs um, is either 10 years from the date of registration or 15 years from the date of filing your application and whichever is longer. And similar to the uh, trademarks and the patent system, there's also an international system available for industrial design protection. Um, and, um, and, and that again helps you reserve your rights um, in your in in in, in other jurisdictions uh, before you actually have to enter uh, those local jurisdictions to determine if you know the local authorities there will actually grant you um, industrial design protection. So that's just uh, the overview of the. Um, uh, uh, the intellectual property that uh, that you may come across, either early stages uh, or uh, much later down the line, um, and uh, for each intellectual property aspect, um, the intellectual property system does have a uh, you know its own yeah its own systems to help you protect those things, whether it be trademarks, uh, patents industrial designs or not discussed uh, copyrights um, and other intellectual property um, issues uh, that you may encounter uh, or that may arise uh, over the course of your business. And from there, uh, I would like to uh, turn the presentation over to uh, Robert. And I'm gonna just stop um, my share. Sounds good, thanks very much, Pablo. Yep. And I'm gonna try to share, so hopefully we'll be able to switch over here. Let's see if it shows anything. And it's showing. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk about the I, the commercialization of your IP. So now that you have um, protected your IP, you've got your patent, you've got your trademark, um, you've got a copyright, which uh, Pavel mentioned we didn't do into a lot of detail. Um, how do you protect it? What's the first thing you want to sort of worry about as you're going down that path? And and the first thing most of you guys will be sort of thinking about is um, what's the best vehicle? Um, do you do it through a company? Do you just carry on? Do you own it personally? All, all There's a bunch of different options that you see on the slide. You've got sole proprietorships, partnerships, companies. There's a bunch of different things you can try. Um, the best, um, the, the one that we're going to talk about for our purposes is going to be a company. Um, and the reason for that is the company gives you a uh, limited liability protection because it's, a company has um, got a number of protections built in. It's the most common vehicle that you'll use for um, building up a business of any sort. It gives you flexibility. Um, it allows you to get certain tax benefits as you move forward with your business because you can, um, the tax code's written to allow companies to, to take benefits. Um, it allows you to grow more easily than, say, for example, if you're a sole proprietor, um, it's hard to grow your business to bring in investors and, and bring in others into the business because they have you don't really have a lot that you can offer them in the same way that you can with a company. Company, you can offer shares. There's a bunch of different things. Um, a company also allows you to, to create a structure of an organization that is fairly clean, um, which allows you as you grow, um, so hopefully one day when you're in, your, in the stage of trying to go public or you're trying to bring on those investors, you get some financing, you can have a clean company which uh, a third party bank or investor might look at and be able to say yeah we know you know what you've been doing you're you're um, keeping your affairs in good order so we want to, we we do want to work with you um, it also allows you if you want to just bring in not necessarily investors but other partners into the business you can do shareholders agreements there's different classes of shares that'll allow you to take a number of steps um, so that you can always be working on figuring out what's the best approach going forward to structure that business to make sure it's maximizing your from a corporate perspective maximizing your benefit now, with respect to the intellectual property itself, the technology that you're gonna be bringing into your business. Um, so I will say as a bit of a caveat, now everyone listening in on this call may not necessarily be a traditional technology company, but um, I've, I view basically every company these days as a technology company. You have no choice but to be incorporating technology. Um, I read a very interesting article today about how um, auto dealers are now have to be technology companies if they want to survive in the new world. I mean, it, it was an opinion piece, but it's it's that sort of thing. It's an auto dealership. They're they're not a technology company. They're selling cars, but that's the sort of stuff that's happening um, because of the the infiltration of technology into everything we do. So then, if you've got technology, you got to make sure you're protecting it properly. And so, 
your IP assignment documentation is going to be how you protect that. So you're going to want to make sure if you have employees, if you have partners, if you have anyone that's helping you build your technology, build your IP, that you've clearly outlined the ownership, that everyone knows who owns what, and that you've got periodic assignments of that intellectual property into the company so that it's not sitting out there in, in some nebulous world where no one knows exactly who owns what, when, where, and how. You want to make sure the company always has that. The one caveat to that is you can't assign intellectual property in advance of its creation. So you need to make sure that you, that's why you need to make sure you do this periodically so that, or at the end of a project or whatever, if something's being created so that you've got all that clearly set out. Non-disclosure agreements are a fairly easy document to put in place with employees, partners, third parties that you might need advice from, um, but are often overlooked. So they're very important to keep in place. Um, and make sure you've got, with respect to intellectual property, waivers of moral rights, um, which are in the copyright space. But especially if you're, if you happen to be in the software world or something like that, you want to make sure that you've got all the copyright rights, as well as the waivers of moral rights from the individuals. And the moral rights are the rights to be associated with the work. Um, there's a few different things that go with it. Um, and if they're not waived, you could end up with a fight on your hands down the road, which you don't want to don't want to have to deal with. Um, the important part on this particular slide is making sure you do this consistently and you're disciplined about it. This is a very easy thing to overlook to make sure you're getting all of these things when you need, like on a periodic basis and when you need them. Um, because where it'll come to bite, come back to bite you is when you do try to get financing in place or you're trying to sell your business or you're trying to go public and third parties are asking for evidence that all the IP is owned by the company and you can't produce it. That makes things very difficult when, when, you, when you're in that position and you don't want to be in that position. Um, similarly, if you engage third-party contractors, you still you want to make sure that you've got clear language built in the contract there, those contracts as well around ownership. Um, so again, the company is going to own any IP created by those third-party contractors. They're going to assign all of their IP. They're going to waive all their intellectual pro sorry, waive all their moral rights in the intellectual property. Um, if they're individuals, if they're company, they're going to secure waivers of moral rights from their employees and their workers. Um, and again, make sure you're doing it at the beginning, sorry, at the end of each project so that you've got these things on file and periodically. And again, you don't want to miss that because this is with a contractor, you're going to have a hard time getting a contractor to, to give you an, an IP assignment after the fact. Now, a lot of startup companies will use open source code in their, if, especially if you're developing code related things that you're, you're, you're building some sort of a technology item that, that needs um, uh, source code of any sort, you often use open source because it's free. It's out there, it's available. The, what you want to make sure you're doing on the open source side is understanding what it is that you're using and what the, the use rights and the use limitations are that go with that open source. Um, things like copyleft licenses have um, can have some very strict limitations on what you can do with that code that you're incorporating into your product. And if for some reason you're incorporating a product that has a very strict copyleft license or another type of uh, open source license that limits your ability to commercialize your IP, you're then going to be in a bit of a bind. So what you want to make sure you're looking at is what are the specific requirements and how do they actually impact your product as you go forward. Um, in a similar way, if you're actually licensing in third-party software, the easiest example is if you're using Microsoft Outlook or something like that as part of your so part of your your business. But if you're actually licensing in something into the piece of software that you're doing, again, another example is Adobe, um, that you have um, clear understanding of what the license rights how they're spelled out and what you can and cannot do with that software um, because you don't want to get into a fight with someone like Microsoft um, over software use because more often than not Microsoft will win they're, they've got the ability to, they've got the experience and the strength and everything to fight those things for a long time so you don't want to get into those particular fights um, so that's something you want to keep a, be aware of when you're licensing in software um, if you're building technology that will in turn ultimately be sold to um, end users, then something else you're going to want to work on is make sure you've got a reasonable end user license agreement in place. Um, so you're going to want to consider how you're going to deliver that sort of an agreement to your end users. Um, it can be through a click wrap, click wrap agreement, um, which is where you, you click the I accept button. Um, someone has an opportunity to read the terms and conditions and they can I accept. Um, you can do a browse wrap agreement where um, by simply browsing through the offering, they've got, um, 
Oh, sorry, my thing messed up for a sec. Uh, they've got the, uh, uh, the 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 license will then be binding on them by by the fact that they've they they browse through. But make sure you know what the terms are that you're agree that you're having the end user agree to, and make sure you're not going too far. You'll often find um, that new companies, young companies, emerging companies will um, sort of piecemeal together a bunch of different provisions that they've seen from different agreements, and that doesn't always work well because they might see a provision that's they really like because it's particularly one-sided um, and it really gives them a lot of rights but maybe that that might not work in the in your particular circumstance so you want to make sure that you've got key understanding of what that means um, and most of the people on this call I'm assuming are going to be from the from the lower mainland or BC generally uh, but understand what laws are going to govern your contract um, if you, most people here, I would assume, would have British Columbia law governed, but if you're selling products or technology globally or across the country, you've got to turn your mind to whether um, British Columbia law is appropriate. It might be, but you have to make sure you're sort of keeping those things in mind. Um, and then the other part that's very important on the, um, in your contract terms, or whatever reps and warranties you're giving with respect to your product, make sure you've clearly thought those out. And what are your liabilities? What are your indemnification obligations? And how are you limiting that liability so that you're not exceptionally at risk? Um, if you're partnering with other businesses, um, either to deliver or to make the initial offering or whatever you're doing, you want to make sure that you've documented everything properly with those businesses as well. Um, where you end up in trouble is if each party enters into this partnership arrangement and there's not a lot of clarity around who is responsible for what um, and you end up expecting the other party to do something and they don't do it or they expect you to do something and you don't do it and then you get into a legal fight. You don't want to be in that sort of a position so you want to make sure that you've had clear discussions up front you, you have a document, a contract of some sort that binds both sides so they understand um, this is what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be taking care of A, B, and C. You're going to be doing E, F, and G. Um, if there's payment going back and forth, you're going to have all of that spelled out. And very importantly is non-compete and non-solicit provisions. Um, so you're depending on what you're partnering to do, um, you want to be very careful that the other side isn't going to be um, taking your clients. So you're going to want to have a non-compete provision that's very clear that says they can't go out and take your business just because they're partnering with you. Similarly with non-solicit provisions, um, many businesses, especially as you guys begin to grow, if you've got a superstar employee, you're going to want to protect him or her. Um, and a lot of businesses will come in and work with you and see, you know, this person was phenomenal. I'm going to hire that person. And you, if you haven't got an, a reasonable non-solicit non provision in your contract with them, you may be stuck in that particular uh, particular situation. Um, now, there's a number of different kinds of agreements um, that you may end up getting into as your business begins to grow. Um, so I've listed the certain ones here. These are sort of more on the services side, but they can come across from any different level. So you've got consulting agreements, outsourcing agreements, license agreements, distribution agreements, um, supply agreements, SaaS and related as a service agreements. So you're going to want to make sure you understand what all the what you need to do with your contracts and how you're going to be documenting them as you go forward. So, for example, with a consulting agreement, that's basically you're going to be providing some level of services for a third party. Um, you're going to be out there doing whatever it is the services are, and your document covers that reasonably well. An outsourcing agreement, you're taking on responsibility for a certain function or multiple functions on behalf of a third party. Um, it could be you're providing um, uh, off, off site support for their technology, um, you know, the help desk related stuff, it doesn't matter, anything like that. Um, a license agreement is if you, you would use that if you're creating some technology that you want to sell to third parties, but you don't want to actually sell it, you want to license it because you want to retain ownership. Um, and so then you would um, grant those, those rights to a third party through a license agreement, and you all have plenty of experience with license agreements. Again, using the Microsoft example, um, you can't use Microsoft software without a Microsoft license agreement in place. Um, Distribution agreements are when you you either get engaged to distribute certain products or services on behalf of a third party or you hire someone to do that for you. Um, and that person or you will go out and find customers and, and 
uh, actually distribute that product. Um, those are, again, very common sort of arrangements that you'll find in all walks of business um, across whether technology or other spaces doesn't really matter. Um, supply agreements on the same front, you're you're going to be supplying someone with uh, supplying a customer with a specific product, or you may be hiring someone to supply you with the raw materials for what you're using to to build in your particular product. Um, and finally, on this particular thing, the SaaS agreements. Um, so if you're delivering services, um, software or otherwise through the cloud, um, you're going to be having an as a service agreement, um, which you're not necessarily licensing, uh, say it's software, you're not licensing it in the traditional sense. Instead, you're granting access to use it in the way that it's offered through the cloud. And again, it has very specific um, requirements around what you need to document in there, um, but it's um, very important for, for the protection of what you wanna make sure you've got covered. Now, the key legal terms you wanna keep in mind, the the they'll be slightly different depending on the circumstances of what it is that what the nature of the contract is that you've got in front of you um, but at a high level these the list of things here are some of the things that you're going to always need to pay a lot of attention to um, indemnification and limits of liability are likely the ones that may result in the majority of any negotiation if you get into any negotiation on these terms and conditions usually if you're dealing with a, a larger party as a customer or a partner um, or it's um, someone with more leverage than you, they're gonna be pushing for fairly robust indemnification obligations where you're gonna be indemnifying for a lot um, and you're gonna have very little in the way of limits and liability. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure as a business that you're only agreeing to terms that are reasonable for what you can actually accept. Now, a lot of smaller companies don't usually put a lot of, uh, they're not that concerned about indemnification and limitations of liability only because if you don't have a lot in the way of assets um, and you agree to an unlimited liability obligation in the contract, the worst that can happen is you'll lose the assets that you've got, but it's not, you're not gonna be losing like millions and millions of dollars or, or you know, there's not gonna be hundreds of people out of work. But as your company grows, you wanna make sure that you've got these, you, you, you've thought these things through. And so if you're a company and you've got 100 employees and you've agreed to an unlimited liability obligation in a contract and something goes wrong on the contract and you're forced to indemnify and you're now on the hook for a billion dollars and your company goes under, well now you are gonna be out all the assets and everything which is gonna be significantly more than you originally started out You know, if you were in your, in your parents' garage. And at the same time, you've got 100 people who are out of work. So, and that brings, brings with it additional risk to you as the owner, director, officer of a business. So there's things like that which you need to turn your mind to. Um, and they're not always easy questions to resolve, but they're things you have to be focused on and, and get guidance on. Um, similarly, reps and warranties. The way you structure your agreement and what you're providing in the way of warranties as to the services you're providing and representations to what it can do, you got to be careful in how you word those provisions because those ones can come back to to cause you a lot of grief as you go through if you haven't really thought them through. And again, depending on with whom you're negotiating, sometimes they will ask for a lot of stuff in the way of reps and warranties. And you may read it and think, it doesn't really matter. But then if something goes wrong, you're gonna be stuck because those provisions, they'll be relying on those provisions from a, a risk perspective. Um, the other one, the other two that I'll just touch on this slide, payment provisions. If you're delivering services or products of any sort, those are your those are your bread and butter. Those are the most important provisions. So you wanna make sure that those are extremely clear and you understand exactly how much you're gonna get paid, when you're gonna get paid, what limitations there might be, if there's any any ability of the third party to hold back payment, anything like that, so that you have clear understanding of what the risk is. And similarly, it allows you to, when you're dealing with your accountants, if you need to get an audit done, all those sorts of things, um, it allows you to be more clear with respect to recognition of revenue and all the stuff that goes with, with that side of your business, which makes life a lot easier. Again, if you're, if you're trying to sell your business, if you're trying to bring in a, an investor or get um, some sort of financing, if your payment provisions are all over the map and not really clear and you've got no, no real ability to demonstrate that you have an obligation to get paid, you're gonna have a hell of a time finding investors or partners or banks to finance you. So that's something to keep in mind. And the last one on this slide, which I'll touch on is the SLAs. Um, depending on the nature of what you're doing, if you're providing service levels, um, so you're gonna you know, guarantee that your, um, your software will run at a certain level for um, you know, 
31, 24 seven, except for, um, except for maintenance periods, then you need to make sure you've clearly understood what your obligations are and what you're spelling out so that you don't end up being offside. Cause they can come back again to cost you a fair amount of money if you don't, um, if you don't have those things clearly spelled out. Um, one of the key considerations with the growth of your business is going to be your online presence. Not surprisingly, whether it's through the internet, like online or um, through apps or whatever, however you're presenting your business to the public, um, your online presence is going to be fundamental. So things like the company that you hire to develop your apps or your website or, or whatever it is that you're using as your vehicle to, to get out there in front of people, um, you're going to want to have clear contracts on that, um, clear understanding of who owns what. And especially since it's your business, tying it back to um, the comments Pavel made earlier on the trademark side of things, you want to make sure that you're not inadvertently um, giving up rights to your trademarks or including provisions in those agreements that allow the, the um, third party developer to start using your trademarks without your permission because that could invalidate your trademarks over time. So you've got to be careful and make sure you're managing those things properly. When you have a website or an app up and running, you're going to want to make sure you have clear terms of use that govern um, the users of that site or those apps. So they know what they can do, what they can't do, um, the limitations, all those things. Included in there will be privacy considerations. You know, um, If you've got an e-commerce functionality in your app or your website, um, there's, you're going to have to make sure you're in compliance with the um, payment card industry security standards, and you're going to have um, make sure you can demonstrate to the users that they their privacy their personal information is going to be protected. So those are all things that you want to cover off in your terms of use. Um, if you're using a hosting provider of some sort to deliver um, whatever the services are that you're providing, again, you may be doing it with your with your app um, or your website. You've just got a host that's hosting that website or that app for you, um, but they're processing all of your payments and all that sort of stuff. Well, you're going to want to make sure you have a very clear contract in place with that organization. Do you have secure and continuous access to your data? Because that's your data and that's going to be fundamental for you to grow your business. But if you can't access that, you're going to be in trouble. What are the SLAs related to that business with respect to their um, how how often they're going to be down? Will they guarantee that their website will be up, you know, 24-7, um, 365 days a year? Or or like what are the limitations? And then always keep in mind backups or redundancies because they're what's the worst case that app say they've got a facility and it's in um i don't know wherever it might be and it gets flooded out and the whole facility is destroyed or it burns down and it's all destroyed are there backups do you have access to anything or are you then out of luck at that point because that's that's a big challenge um and always try to do a security audit or have an, have the right to conduct security audits to make sure that the information that they're storing or hosting for you or processing for you um, is is secure and that um, you can demonstrate to your customers that their information is secure because you're the one who will bear the brunt of any bad PR if there's a breach. You, you may be able to try to point to the, the hosting provider and say, well, it was hosting provider X. They're the one that suffered the breach. Your customer is going to look at you and say, you're the one I gave the information to. I don't care who you hired. So that's very important on your side to make sure you've done that. Um, on the data privacy and security side of things, um, I'll, I'll do a quick plug really quickly. Um, one of our colleagues, um, Grace, uh, Grace is going to be giving a talk in a couple of days on Wednesday, um, Grace Shaw, on privacy-related issues for startup companies. Um, but I'll, I'll, for now, for the purposes of this, I just wanted to touch very briefly on um, you want to make sure that privacy issues are are front and center in whatever you're doing from a business as you're growing your business. It's um, the privacy world generally is becoming a lot more important in terms of managing your, your business and growing your business. And you'll see whenever there's a privacy breach, it's front page news. Um, it causes a lot of damage to the business. It costs them a lot of money. And so you want to make sure you've got all of this stuff clearly laid out. And the easiest first step you will always want to take is make sure your privacy policy is clear and it's there. You have a privacy policy and that anyone who accesses your site will understand what the, their rights are when they're using your site. Um, there are different issues depending on where you're conducting business. Um, if, you're if you're conducting business strictly in Canada, you've got to comply with Canadian privacy legislation. If you somehow touch Europe with respect to your, your, your business offering, um, you're going to have to worry about whether the general data protection regulation in Europe applies. And that's a fairly robust piece of legislation. So you'd need third party advice to make sure you're in compliance. Um, but those at a high level, you just want to make sure that you've got all of those issues sort of addressed um, in the top of your mind. Um, 
So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, and I don't know. Jaden, do you see any? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Pablo and thank you, Robert. That was a wonderful session. Uh, we did have one question. It was in regards to the first half of the presentation. And the question was, how much does the patent slash process normally cost? I believe that's what they were referring to. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah. So, um, so with the uh, the patent process, you can you can imagine that the short answer is it depends, um, and it depends on a number of things: uh, the complexity of your invention um, and the uh, number of um, I guess uh, prior art documents that you need to contend with uh, during the prosecution stage. So we'll focus on I guess the um, the complexity of your invention first. When you're drafting a patent application. Um, think of it as a technical manual that goes into detail exactly what your invention is and how your invention functions. So you want to describe it in words and in, in addition to that, supplement it with figures uh, to support exactly what you do. So you can imagine that such documents can get lengthy very quickly, particularly for a complex invention. Um, and the amount of time that needed to draft the application and to really hone in on what the inventive aspect is, is the amount that you actually play the patent or pay the patent agent to do. Um, so I'll give you a rough estimate. Um, typically for a very simple um, invention, like a simple mechanical device, it, it's not uncommon for it to cost around seven to $10,000 to draft. Uh, for a more complex invention, it can easily exceed 15K uh, and for, uh, very complex ones that do require a lot of detail, um, you're looking at close to 30. And that's just for the drafting. The next step of it is, of course, the prosecution of the application, which is the back and forth with the patent office that you need to have. So the patent office can really throw anything at you um, that they think a skilled person in the art would know. Um, and so they might cite six documents against you, in which case you would have to rebut against each of those documents and explain why your invention is novel, inventive, and over those documents. Um, and, uh, and that kind of back and forth is really a black box that people don't quote on um, for just for the reasons of it's, it's dangerous for me to quote you $10,000 when in fact the work itself could cost 40K. Um, I'd be out of pocket 30K. So, uh, so to give you a good uh, an idea, um, typically, I'd say earmark like at least $40,000 for a proper application and to see it through and don't even uh, but don't don't uh, don't hang your hat on on the 40k because it can easily exceed it depending on what the examiner throws at you. Um, so uh, so it is an expensive process and that's why there are strategies for you to drag out um, the application process so that you have enough funds um, in your war chest to, um, to do battle uh, with the patent examiner if you need to. Great, we look like we have two more questions coming in. Um, I don't know if you can read those, Robert, um, or I can I see read that, that one. one out loud. Yeah, Yeah. no, I saw that one. Um, so the, the, I will read it out quickly. It was just, I heard IP is either very expensive to set up well, otherwise it'll be costly with more funded companies finding loopholes and that it's better to rush to market. What are your thoughts on this? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because it depends entirely on what the IP is and what it is that you're developing. Um, rushing to market in some cases can can get you sort of your foot in the door to protect something before someone else um, is out there. And then it give, might give you some time to actually refine your product um, and you know make sure you've got all the protections, sort of going back to what Pablo was mentioning around patent protections. If you're able to get a patent for something, um, you've, got it, you've got it to a degree um, refined enough to a degree that you can get a patent, then that might give you some level of protection. Um, but it also, it's finding that general balance between making sure what you're going to market with is actually going to be worthwhile and someone's going to actually want to be able to, you know, if you go to market with a piece of software just to get, just to be the first one out there, but it's filled with bugs um, and you've got a whole bunch of problems every time anyone's using it, you're not going to have a lot, your, your reputation is going to be hit hard and you're not going to have a lot of success with that product, even though you were the first to market. And then you'll have the other guys, the bigger guys coming by and seeing, well, that's a great idea. Let's fix it up and, and get it out there. So 
it's a tough one. Um, you you want to try to find that balance between being quick but being um, you know efficient and going out there with a quality product. So um, not necessarily the perfect answer to the question there, uh, Sabian, but um, I think that's kind of how you would normally approach it. And then it looks like we have two more questions come in as well. Um, I'll go ahead and read this um, one. If, would you like to answer both these two? I think we still have four minutes. Yep. Yeah. Happy okay. to. So the next question is, is my invention patentable if it solves an old problem by using my newly developed mathematical equation? So the, uh, the, um, the newly developed mathematical equation is an interesting one um, because it's one of those like, did it already exist in nature and you just merely found what already existed in nature? Um, and so the mathematical equation itself, I'd be hesitant to think that you'd be able to patent that equation by itself simply because it's a discovery. You can treat it as a discovery of something that's already known or that's or that not already known, but already exists um, in nature. Um, the, um, uh, the, the mathematical description, um, notwithstanding the fact that, um, that uh, you recently figured it out, um, can be seen from an examiner as something that's existed, um, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't know about it. So the next question, of course, is what does this mathematical equation actually do? So um, depending on what country you're in, um, um, and, and I say this because different countries have different thresholds of patentability, depending on what country you're in, um, they might look at aspects where um, there's a, a tangible thing that you're actually doing um, that uh, this mathematical equation does uh, it, it affects a tangible change that that creates you know uh, an outcome that you otherwise can't you know get at. Um, that in itself, then in that instance, then perhaps it is patentable. So um, long story short, I guess in this case is we and it's probably not the answer that satisfies you the most, but. Yes, you do need to sit down um, with, um, with with someone who does patents, um, uh, where they can walk through the details of what exactly you've done uh, in terms of uh, your mathematical equation, what it does, and and, and how it actually solves an old problem. But uh, just from the question itself, um, it, it 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 it's um, it's hard to give you a yep, yes, or no answer. And even when you sit down with a patent agent they will probably give you an answer with a lot of caveats because that's the kind of stuff that uh, that does play in the gray zone for um, for a lot of people. Uh, so we had another one. Um, any thoughts on IP budgets for smaller companies or general ways to think about patent valuations? So I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, so there's, um, there are a variety of funding sources um, that are available uh, to uh, inventors depending on their industry of invention. So a um, government source, for, uh, for example, is um, one that I commonly deal with is the uh, IRAP program. Um, I think it's, uh, yes, and, and that's, that's one thing to, uh, to, to, con yeah, to, uh, to, yeah, to, to definitely look at, um, whether it's provincial or federal, there are definitely a lot of buckets of money reserved for innovation. Um, and, um, and it's definitely, um, yeah, so a lot of it, some of it you'll have to front yourself, but, um, but other times where you make the appropriate applications to the uh, appropriate government organization, they will you know, vet the application to see whether it meets their thresholds for giving you funding. And if it does, then you will be entitled to the funding. Um, so that's uh, so for startup companies. Um, that's definitely one thing to do your research on. Is all right, you know, your industry. What exactly do you do? And then within your industry, uh, what are the available sources there are? And uh, there are definitely numerous ones depending on what industry you're in. Um, and general ways of thinking about patent valuation. Um, what's important, I guess, for a business for, I guess, starting out is that, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You can spend a lot of money on developing a patent portfolio that gets you nowhere. Um, and sometimes there is a disconnect between, say, the invention that you think is going to be your home run. Um, and in fact, it's not your home run because there's no commercializable aspect to it versus another part that you think, eh, yeah, whatever. And it winds up being the one that, you know, makes the consumers tick. Um, 
that kind of um, assessment, you know, obviously hindsight is 2020. But when you're going in and you're going through the patent application process, the patent application process is lengthy enough for you to probably figure out what patent actually matters to you in the long run. And then from there, I'd say for a startup company, only pursue the ones um, that really give you the biggest bang for your buck that actually have commercial value. Uh, the other ones that are just you know, you know, paper padding, uh, for lack of a better word, um, that's probably not the best way that you can um, spend your money is just to pad your patent portfolio. A uh, savvy purchaser of your portfolio will quickly figure out what's worthless and what is worth something. Um, and in terms of valuing your patent, um, there are a number of um, people, there, yeah, there are, I guess, uh, trained people uh, like economists um, who do practice specifically in this area where they do look at you know, the value of your business as a whole versus the amount of money that's actually generated from the worth of your patent, and then from there decide what the value of your patent is. Um, that aspect, say you're in a transaction, um, those are the kinds of people that lawyers work hand in hand with uh, in arriving at appropriate purchase prices um, for your patent portfolio or whatever else, um, so that you're not, um, so that no, no party is overpaying for a portfolio and no party is being underpaid for a portfolio. Great. So we can have the opportunity to move this to the expo if we would like to have some more questions answered. Um, or we can answer a few more. It's really up to both of you. We would like to do that. Um, we can do a couple more. If there's, there's, seems like there's just yep. a couple more left. So that's fine. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So the next one would be provide guidance on how the how to best work with open source software development strategy. Um, I can take that one, Pablo. So I think what you'd probably be wanting to look at when you're considering how to use open source in your software development strategy is how, first off, whether you have the, the, the people to help um, write the code that you need, the open source code. If you have people who can come up with their own code that meets the functionality of what you need to do or what you want to do with your software um, and you don't have to use open source, then that's fine. But if you if you don't have those people, open source fits a very convenient hole where it makes it very easy for you to get a product, get something out there that you might be able to commercialize. Um, so what you'd want to do then is just make sure, again, as I mentioned earlier, just understand what the limitations are with the, the open source code that you're going to be using because there are there are specific license terms that apply to all open source um, code that's out there. Um, and then um, you build that into your code, but in, in release one or whatever, you know, your very first release that you're doing, um, you may use it, but then as you begin to um, refine your product and maybe you're you're starting to grow your business you may realize that maybe that code because of the terms on it has some limitations on on how you want to develop your business um, that at that point you may want to start considering whether you're going to write your own code now you can't copy the open source code that's going to be copyright infringement which will trigger other issues for you but you can create your own code as long as you have an idea of what you want to do um, you can make your own code and have your team create that code so that you're now developing something proprietary going forward that doesn't infringe, whether it's the open source license terms or third parties license terms, um, but then gives you something that you can go to market with that no longer has any of those proprietary limitations based on the open source uh, software license agreements that go with it. So it's, it's again, it's going to be kind of an understanding of what you need and depending on where you're at in your specific um business where the development of your business and how best to maximize your resources because you don't want to spend a ton of money writing software uh, on resources writing software if there's already a ready-made piece of open source software out there that can give you that functionality um, that's been tested it's been you know it's been used it's working well um, and you know it, it may not have any serious limitations and as long as you're aware of those then you're good take one more um, Thomas what's the current cost for long-term worldwide patents for industrial hardware technology uh, should I take that yeah I'll take that <laughs> sure yeah um, so it's um, short answer is that it varies um, the uh, the patent system like the trademark system is uh, jurisdictional in nature 
meaning that you know a, a patent granted in Canada is of no value in the United States, and likewise, a, a patent granted in the United States is of no value and not enforceable here in Canada. So it really depends on, I guess, the um, the number of jurisdictions that you've protected in, um, and um, and um, and sorry, it's just so that I have this question. Yeah, number of jurisdictions that you've actually uh, pr uh, protected in, and that will dictate the costs. So because of the jurisdictional nature of patents, you're going to have to pay each local authority, um, you know, the uh, a maintenance fee or you know maintenance procedures in order to maintain your patent in that jurisdiction for the 20-year protection period. So you can imagine that you know with 10 jurisdictions versus 20 jurisdictions, there's going to be a cost difference there. Um, other things during prosecution that you need to consider um, is uh, translation costs from uh, non-English speaking, non-French speaking jurisdictions. Um, and uh, those are the things that you also need to consider. On top of that, uh, the other things you need to consider is that, say, I'm qualified to practice in Canada and the United States, but um, in order for you to actually seek a patent in, say, China, um, you'll have to engage a local agent there to do the work. So there's also that added cost of engaging foreign agents that you need to factor in. So long story short, maintaining a patent portfolio is very, very, very expensive. So you better make sure that the patent portfolio that you're protecting is worth the money that you're investing in it. Otherwise, you are really throwing money into a pit. Um, and it's not, and leaving that part aside, it's not worth your money to try to protect your invention in 140 countries around the world. Choose the countries that you're doing the most business in, say 95% of your business, 90% of your business, whatever your pockets can stomach. Because if you're maintaining your patent, say, I don't know, say in Bulgaria, but you're not doing no business in Bulgaria, again, you're wasting money. Uh, protect your patents where you're actually doing the core commercial aspects or you're, you're driving the core revenues from. Uh, that's where you'll get the biggest value of your, uh, for, your, for your patent portfolio. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, it can be very expensive. And when I say expensive, over the course of the 20 years, it's, it's pretty easy for you to sink millions into a patent portfolio in terms of protection. Um, if uh, if you do cover you know a wide number of jurisdictions, or if you keep it slim, then sure you can keep it you know, on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars.